Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Nagar Sumo. I'm the curator here at the Center on Contemporary Art, uh, known as Polka Seattle. I'm really happy to welcome you to the second edition of our Artist Talks for our annual member exhibition, well, where we will be in conversation with Tatiana Garmendia, Kevin Regan, and Esra Ebru. These are the three artists that we'll be focusing on today getting their perspectives on their individual works as well as this discussion about what it means, what it has meant to them to make art during these trying but hopefully resilient times. And so I am going to already give the floor over to first Tatiana Garmendia, who will tell us a little bit about her work, but also about the experience of making and making art during this period. So Tatiana, welcome thank and thank you. you. So this show is really about the resilience of artists in the face of the pandemic. And the piece that I uh, have in this show today is Alchemical 37 Sojourner Truth. And um, it's an imaginal portrait. It's not a portrait of the actual Sojourner Truth. Um, and it's, it's coming out of a series in which I am using the language of cubism, the language of pop art and feminist historicism to celebrate women from history. And for me, Sojourner Truth is personally significant. Um, I might, <laughs> I don't know, I might get emotional talking about her. Uh, hers was the first feminist text that I came across. And it came at a very crucial time in my life when um, I was far from family. I was in a, in a, very bad situation and her words from this text that i read is ain't i a woman it's a really well-known speech a short speech i'm sure it was shorter than what i'm saying right now because she knew how to address an audience and address them well but it talked about um, her strength her resilience and her ability to surmount the minimal expectations others had of her and so she has been a guiding light. And um, during the pandemic, I was, you know, like everybody else, I was cloistered at home. And uh, I was fortunate, I was able to work from home. Um, and my art practice very naturally progressed in my home. You know, we moved everything around. My, I set up a studio, I teach. So my studio became my classroom because I was filming and demonstrating and uh, conducting my Zooms from my studio. And I had a lot of time in that space to reflect on everything that was happening. And so Sojourner Truth went from being a feminist icon and a, a personal light of survival that I used in my own life to being kind of emblematic of a lot of the things that I was seeing happening. We had um, Black Lives Matter really change um, the way uh, the broader community looked at issues of inequity. Um, we had Say Her Name, which I think really impacted what Black Lives Matter and how they represented women of color and black women and their suffering especially. And so this is why I chose this image. And it's watercolor. And um, the image itself, is from a cutout from a magazine of a, a bride of color. And I place her in a mirrored box and work from those distorted, fragmented images. Um, and I, I was thinking about Sojourner, and I was thinking about all of the, you know, people of color were impacted more than others because so many of them are First responders, so many of them are working in service industries that are essential industries. And so I also not only worked with the mirrors, but I worked with patterns from masks as faces are masked. So that's what this piece is about. And that's my contribution to this show. Um, definitely painting has been a lifesaver for me uh, personally. And during this time, being able to uh, contribute through my art and through my teaching coming out of the studio uh, really kept the sense of isolation um, at a at a manageable space so. 
Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Again, my name is Kevin Regan, and first I'd just like to take a moment to thank the Center on Contemporary Art and the curator, Nagara Kudumu, and it's very exciting to be in a show with such talented artists. And I thought first I'd give a little bit of background about myself, and then I would talk about my painting, which is called 2020 Awakening. My training is actually in environmental science and law, and I'm a practicing intellectual property attorney. And so these are fields that require a lot of rational, linear thought. And my artistic practice is the exact opposite. I draw heavily from intuition and my feelings. And so it's the tension between these two worlds that informs my work. And so this piece again, it's called 2020 Awakening. And I started the piece on New Year's Day of 2020, when I had no idea what kind of year it was gonna be. And I actually finished the piece on New Year's Eve of 2020. So for me, the painting kind of captures the arc of a very difficult year. In my work, I tend to use a lot of bold colors. And to me, that reflects the world of my feelings and my unconscious mind. And when I start painting, I don't have an idea in mind. I just start painting and forms emerge. And here, there was these abstract forms that were sort of ominous and eventually a self-portrait emerged. And again, there's a lot of analysis that goes into my law and my science work, but with my painting, the analysis kind of comes after when I'm trying to understand what it is I've actually created. And one of my favorite things to do is when I have works showing in a gallery to sort of hide in the back and listen to what people have to say. And I saw this one individual, he said uh, this reminded him of a death mask. And for me, it does reflect, uh, I live alone, and there was a lot of emotional and physical isolation during 2020. And there was a lot of grief that came from the way of life before and my interactions and relationships. And I do see symbols of death as often being an indication of transformation. And to me, this sort of reflects a, a mask dissolving, slipping away, new layers emerging beneath. And for me, 2020 was a time of great awakening and also a time of spiritual growth that was motivated by a lot of feelings of anxiety and uh, emotional distress. And to me, some of the green colors are sort of a sickly kind of feel of uncertainty. And even now in 2021, entering into 2022, there's a lot of uncertainty. And I guess for me, the painting was sort of a transformational process about coming to grips with loss and feelings of uncertainty and new beginnings. And so again, I'm just very excited to be a part of this show and I'm looking forward to the group discussion. welcoming Ezra Esbru to the conversation. She will remain off camera, but she will still join us and be a part of the conversation. The first question that I like to pose, and whoever wants to, to take it, a stab at it first can feel free. What are some of the things that you have noticed personally within your practice, but also sort of in broader observations of either the art community here or mm -hmm. art communities in other places? that are a stark difference from previous to the pandemic to during this period? Well, I think one of the biggest things that I've seen 
is um, that they're like the rest of society during the pandemic, there's been the divide between the top 3% and the rest of us has really grown wider. And this, I think, is amplified in the art community. Um, I, for many years as a practicing artist and as a teaching artist, I've uh, bristled at how much my teaching um, takes over the studio practice. Because it's a, it's a service that requires a lot of intellectual, emotional, physical um, commitment. And uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, I was fortunate I served on uh, For Culture to award grants. And, and I say fortunate because it was a, a real humbling experience to realize that I had a layer of protection from, from being in a teaching position. That so many of my brothers and sisters who are artists, you know, so many of us lost everything. You know, people couldn't, couldn't afford the most basic necessities. So that was one thing. I know a lot of artists who, uh, through their hustle, through art fairs, through their studio practice and sales, were making a living and suddenly Everything was in lockdown. They had no way of making a living. People who had to suddenly pivot and try to suddenly enter and compete with all the noise. When what really happens with artists being in front of Ezra's piece here, as beautiful as it looks online, it's nothing like seeing the surface, seeing it in person. And that's where the sale happens when people see the piece. And so I saw a lot of suffering and I saw a lot of attrition, I think, um, that artists are very important to society, that what we say usually motivates changes in our broader ideas of who we are and what we are. And when we look at history and we see who we are, we often don't look at accounting records or you know, construction records. We, what, what do we look at? We look at the arts of a, of a peoples to know who they were. And we're basically losing generations of artists who have something to say because they've succumbed mm -hmm. to the attrition of economics. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one big thing that I've seen. Thank you for sharing. One thing that I noticed, I want to say like for the difference um, of the art that was made uh, you know, pre-pandemic versus Pose. The one thing that I did notice was actually people looking way more online, um, more than ever. I actually felt like I was like my work was actually being looked at way more than it ever was because um, people didn't have anywhere else to go. They were just stuck in their own <laughs> poems and in front of their, uh, you know, devices. And it became this really powerful tool that kind of connects us. And so I was surprised at that aspect of it, because for a minute I um, was showing actually what when the pandemic was going on. And of course, you know, the place that I was showing, um, it was shut down. I was wondering, like, what's going to happen? But at the same time, I just became aware how much people were paying more attention and looking more closely now that they didn't have a million different distractions that were pulling them in all different directions. So that's one thing that I noticed. I was like, and I also became aware there's just so many artists in the world, <laughs> you know, and um, and I guess one question that comes to my mind is. How do we make this make more of this? How do we, you know, um, create more opportunities for artists to be able to share their work more? Because there's so many of us <laughs> and so many good artists. And just to briefly touch on uh, what these two have shared uh, in 2020, my my goal for myself was, you know, I'm sick of staring at screens all day. I'm going to go out in the real world. I'm going to go to art events. I'm going to meet people. And of course, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men. So 
like everybody else, I turned to uh, Instagram and other tools, and I did find it gave me a chance to interact with artists online. And it's just, it feels though so nice to be back in a physical space, so, yeah. Thank you for sharing that with all very salient views um, that you all have touched upon. When the call first came across your desk, what about the theme resonated most with you at the time? And it could or could not be a solely artistic response. It could be a completely, totally conceptual, intellectual, or even emotional sort of response. But what resonated most with you about the theme that made you want to apply and, and, and be considered? You know, one thing that I initially felt when the pandemic hit, you know, besides the panic uh, and anxiety of what was going on and we didn't know what was going on, um, was just my need to, it was just like a gut survival feeling of like, go to the studio and make work. <laughs> now that you can't go anywhere else, for me, just moving my hands and, and my body became just really important to me. And um, and I couldn't really sit still at home and I'm not that kind of person anyway, and it kind of amplified it for me. So I guess for, for me personally speaking, just the resilience of just being alive and having this obstacle was just like a really natural reaction. Mm -hmm. um, so when I heard the, even the theme of the, the show, I was like, well, yeah, I you know, spent my time in that. Because <laughs> it, it surprised me because I didn't, you know, I didn't know how I would react mm -hmm. if you were to tell me the year before, hey, there's going to be a big pandemic. I'd probably think, oh, I'd probably cower and stay at home. But, you know, I surprised myself and I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I did stay at home, of course, but I also went to my studio right. the whole time. But, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just to briefly, uh, when I saw the theme about the pandemic and resilience, you know, I thought about this piece in particular, which as I mentioned, really kind of reflected the arc of 2020 for me. And uh, one of the things I think is really interesting is to see some of the common elements of, of the work. And I, I think it's always interesting to show to see how things are curated. And so the, uh, the three artists here today, we each have a lone figure you know, um, you know, the you know, details of a face that convey a lot of emotion. And I think that's one of the things that artists do is we kind of tap into this, uh, you know, collective unconscious, these archetypes of what's going on in the world. And so to have a chance to put it in context with other artists going through similar things and to capture some of this period in time, just a really exciting opportunity. Yeah, um, well, I think, for me, I, I, of all the pieces in my studio, this one was the one that most, I think, aligned with um, the call. And so I felt an irresistible urge to respond. Um, I think beyond that, Coca really is um, such a, such a pivotal space for contemporary artists. Um, Coca puts on shows that are brave and that make us question and look at things like this, like the resilience of being an artist, of pushing yourself to go in the studio, to follow the arc, for example, of that trajectory from the beginning of a, a year of pandemic and isolation to the end. Um, and so I, I just had to heed that call. It's like the, <laughs> instead of a siren's call that calls you to destruction, it's a siren's call that calls you to life. And in a year filled with death, um, it was something that I had to respond to. So thank you for sharing that. Um, when you look around at your fellow artists' work at the exhibition as a whole, what are some of the um, most uh, poignant conversations that you feel like are sort of coming out? whether it be conversations among certain groups of work mm -hmm. or between your work and another artist's work or in the exhibition as a whole? 
Well, I, I kind of started to tell Ezra before that um, my, my husband and I, we came to the opening and I was immediately from that door like drawn into uh, eating strawberries. And it's such a, I mean, I hope that the camera is able to capture the, the texture of that strawberry being caught by this mask and it. It brought so many things up for me, I think. Um, our, how our, our production of food and, and the ability to get food and other things became um, a, a thing of concern. We live in, an, in, in a society with incredible privileges. We have roads and we have trucks and we have ships and everything that we want from anywhere in the world arrives here. Um, but we rarely think about the hands that pick the vegetables and the fruit. And I, I thought of strawberries and how many farms were taken from Japanese and Japanese Americans. Um, I thought about uh, this mask is metal. It almost, it, it reminds me a little bit of a fencing mask. It also looked jeweled. Um, and so it made me questions, made me question privilege. It made me question all of our assumptions of of what it takes to live. I thought of that beautiful, the brush strokes of these leaves, this lush background with the butterflies. I thought about how nature has been able to come back out <laughs> since we haven't been out in traffic. Um, and, and about how even our simplest pleasures, the sensual pleasure of eating a strawberry carries so much meaning into it. And it's something that I think that the pandemic has made us become aware of in a way that, you know, I think maybe only philosophers and culture critics were really aware of a lot of these things before we were all forced to think about them. So this is a piece that really struck me. And this one also, <laughs> I think it's kind of cool that I was between them because I thought of essential workers also. And um, this, this print, um, you know, it's Appalachian Dreams, very far from here, but I, I know or earlier uh, in the year, I, I delivered a, a show and, and we traveled through and we saw the energy from the wind, the wind farms. And I thought about all of the hidden things that we, the structures that we don't think about and the people who work that we don't even think about. And I thought about how many people were putting their lives on the line um, for us. You know, people that we rarely thanked and now, you know, like I know in New York, people were like at six o'clock were making noise every day so that the essential workers knew that people were grateful. And you know, I live out in the suburbs. We didn't do that. <laughs> but this piece reminded me uh, of that gratitude that we owe. So those are just two pieces that I felt strongly pulled towards. One of the things that really struck me it's, um, and, uh, is there's a progression of the pieces as you move through the center on contemporary art here. It starts out with uh, forms and images of nature. And then as you follow the wall, there's this point where things are very abstract. And I know the, the viewer can't see all this right now, but you know, there's these paintings that have bold colors and shapes and forms. And then there's a very abstract piece and then I love how my piece is placed kind of right on the border between the abstraction and the figurative, more figurative works, which is uh, just a perfect placement for it. And uh, as, as these works progress, there's individual faces and a lot of these faces convey emotion. Uh, on my piece, I think a lot of it, it, it reminds me of being rudely awakened. It's like if I'm in a deep sleep and all of a sudden I get rudely awakened by a noise or by somebody and I'm disoriented, I don't know where I am. The eyes are half closed. And then as these uh, paintings and works progress, there's faces that convey a lot of emotion. There's a lot of uh, looks of trepidation, such as in Estra's piece, there's um, you know, just this look of uncertainty. And uh, Tatiana's piece has these great expressive eyes. And then as, as the wall continues, it starts to hit a, a group of people together and it sort of reflects that tension between us kind of isolated and trying to interact with society, but people have masks on. And then the very last piece is this great piece from Steve Jensen, which 
uh, really reflects some of the images of death. It's like a sort of three-dimensional work. It's got some painting on it. It's got this uh, canoe form with glass skulls. And uh, again, as you move through the, the gallery, it's just a progression of emotion. And uh, that's one of the things I really appreciate about the show. I guess one thing that I notice is there's um, a lot of reflection and um, especially in the figurative works and even in that group painting, um, there's just, yeah, a lot of like solitude and naturally because they were all solitude. And, um, and also just the connection to nature with some of the pieces and how they uh, communicate. Um, because I think a lot of people did spend a lot of time in nature um, to get outside their homes. Um, yeah, so a lot of solitude reflection. <laughs> I see. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, one last question before maybe we open it up to our guests asking some questions as well. What are the things um, throughout this process, however difficult it's been, that you are looking forward to, that you're excited about in terms of the the directions you will take your own practice. I think for me that um, happened during the pandemic was I, uh, prior to it, I mainly uh, painted my friends and here and there I would paint myself and when after the shutdown, I because I couldn't get in touch with my friends anymore or be physically involved with them, um, I took more and more photos of myself and, and just primarily I've been painting myself. And it just sort of turned into this like massive series where um, I explore various. Uh, it's like a spectrum of not only feelings, but of um, different characters. And um, so it, it, it kind of evolved from just purely from, you know, self portraits to uh, some uh, narrative um, path. So that's one thing that happened with me. And I'm, I'm guessing that's where the, you know, work will move forward to even deeper, I hope. Um, so one of the things that I think all of the artworks here show is a real um, devotion to craftsmanship and to that interaction, that physical interaction with the work. And that's definitely something that um, I saw grow in my practice. Um, over the year where I, <laughs> I was in that studio working with the materials every day and, um, and in a sense I saw my work moving from uh, a more realistic depiction of the images that I was creating that I worked from uh, to something that was beginning to once again, because I did that in my youth, but I left it behind, once again engage the materials themselves. And while still depicting something that my audience could recognize, a face, an eye, a mirrored reflection, um, really play more with material itself and speak to that language of painting. So that's something that came out of, you know, the, the glass is half full. <laughs> that's something that came out of that sustained practice from being locked in to the studio. Wonderful, thank you so much. At this time, I'd like to open up to any of our guests if you have any questions, comments, anything you would like to share with regards to the discussion we've had today or the artworks, please feel free. Well, I, I want to say I appreciate um, the explanations because I, I know Tatiana personally. I'm so, so poetic, and I'm not poetic. So <laughs> I always need an explanation, and yours was fascinating too, Kevin. And um, so anyway, I appreciate the explanation. I have to go out and just try to, to fill the meter. Um, so I may have missed this, 
Uh, but in case anybody did ask this, I'm curious. So in terms of what a lot of us, you know, Tatiana, you talked about privilege and you know, now this privileged country is dealing with things like supply chain problems. Yeah. So my question is, have you as artists run into supply chain issues? <laughs> and if you have, what have you had to be creative about? <clears throat> yeah, I, I definitely ran into supply chain issues. Um, so I, I had a solo show to deliver and framing supplies <laughs> were a problem. And um, Scott, my husband, devised a way to work with plywood and create mold, which is actually, this is plywood molding. He was, he made my frames out of plywood molding. You know, he was just very creative with materials. Um, and because I, I teach at Seattle Central College, my students, we, you know, first of all, materials, the prices, like we've seen prices of everything go up. Boy, these, I feel so bad because tuition has gone up, cost of living has gone up, our art materials have gone up, and so many of them are no longer, um, no longer available. The, the biggest art supplier in the city is Dick Blick because they, they put everybody else out of business. They practically put Daniel Smith out of business. They, they put Utrecht out of business and, and uh, bought them out. And they had big supply chain issues. And so, you know, having to come up with alternatives for materials for students to use uh, was also something so, I didn't have as much an issue in terms of paint or paper because I'm grubby and greedy that way. I have a lot of materials and, you know, in, my, in my studio. And, um, and when I did, I, did and be, I got a grant earlier this year or at the beginning of this year, the 2020 Artist Trust Fellowship. And it came at just the right time because I was basically painting over my old canvases. And, and that wasn't because there's a supply chain. We had missing canvases in the supply chain, but it was an economic condition. Like, okay, do I buy canvas or paint over older ones? Oh, I'm gonna paint over older ones. That's a no brainer for me at this point. So, so that wasn't that issue, but I know that for a lot of people and for some people who didn't have space in their home, a supply chain issue is being able to go to your studio, <laughs> you know, or people who depended on um, presses, right? Anybody who needs a press to do their work, no presses, or who needed a foundry, no foundry work, you know, so people who need specialized equipment to go to specialized uh, places when all of that shut down, that's, a, that's like we're fortunate that we were able to paint at home, we're painters, you know, you can always like move the stuff out of your kitchen <laughs> and paint on a counter there. Not so easy to do for sculptors or printmakers and photographers, for example, in some, some cases. Thank you for that question. It's super relevant, super, super relevant. It doesn't look like it's going to ease up any time soon. Yeah. So yeah. thank you for asking that. Any other questions or comments? Before we wrap up, no. well, thank you first and foremost to the artists Tatiana Garmendi and Kevin Regan, as wherever the exhibition will be open through January 15th. We will have two more talks on January 8th and the final one on the closing day of the exhibition on January 15th. So you have more time to see the show, more time to hear from our remaining artists. Thank you so much for joining and for sharing in this exhibition and the discussion and discourse from our artists. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you again to the artists as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.